are joining us today with our special guest, Mr. Rick Goldschmidt. He's been with uh, Rankin Bass. He is the historian, and he's been working with this for over 30 years. Wow. So let's give our guest a hand. <laughs> You can also find his merch table on the third floor of the America's March. So make sure you go to hit that up because I'm sure there's some great stuff over there too. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, so today we're going to talk about Rudolph, which is probably my favorite Rank and Bass television special. That. Woo! That and Mad Monster Party are the reason that I do what I do. Um, so after I wrote my first book in 1997, I, the next book I knew had to be Rudolph, and I did this book in 2001. And it's been pretty, pretty popular. In fact, all of the things you see circulate online, 10 things you didn't know about Rudolph, and they call Rudolph a bull, uh, or they say the show is about bullying and, and try to put it down now, but all the information they get is pretty much out of my book. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that. Um, and, and then there's some things that are circulating through the internet that aren't true as well, which, you know, only I probably would know. Um, so, to, to give you some background about how the special came to be, Arthur Rankin, um, originally, the company Rankin Bass Productions was called Videocraft International, and you'll see that in the credits on a lot of their early work. And the first two projects they did were financed by bank loans, The New Adventures of Pinocchio and The Tales of the Wizard of Oz, which were for kiddie shows around the country. Um, they were short little cartoons that could be spread out over a week. And um, I don't think Arthur liked that arrangement because it was tough to pay the loans back and they didn't make very much money off of those two shows. So he was looking to get on the networks and the first special they did was Return to Oz, which was in the early part of 1964 for the General Electric Company. And um, they tied that into their products with a, a free bracelet that you would get if you bought an iron. <laughs> and this was the first time The Wizard of Oz, what, there was a sequel to it. Um, the very first time that the characters were used again, other than the TV series, in network television. So they were airing the film every year, and then this was this was going to be sort of their breakthrough, but it really wasn't. It didn't do that well. It was cell animated, and it wasn't the blockbuster they were hoping it would be. And their next project was Rudolph, and they did it in Animagic, which the new Adventures of Pinocchio was done in. And it actually aired at 4.30 in the afternoon on NBC. It wasn't. Back then, they would air family television even earlier than they would years later. And when it hit the airwaves, it was a blockbuster. It took most of the ratings uh, of the three networks. And uh, Arthur Rankin got the idea to do it as a television special because he was friends with Johnny Marks, who wrote the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And they involved Robert L. May, who came from Evanston, Illinois, not too far from me. Actually, he was the same age as I was when I wrote my Rudolph book, when he wrote his Rudolph book, which is interesting. Um, but his Rudolph book was just a few pages about Rudolph wasn't able to play reindeer games, and, you know, and Santa finally discovered he had a red nose. It wasn't the kind of thing that Romeo Muller developed with the Island of Misfit Toys, King Moon Racer, 
Hermie, the dentist. I mean, these things really were significant in the storytelling of, of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So Johnny Marks, he didn't want it really to be on television because the song was so popular, everybody was recording it, Dean Martin, Johnny Mathis, and he Gene felt, Audrey. what's that? Gene Autry. Oh yeah, Gene Autry, the first <laughs> recording of the song. And his, his wife was the reason that he actually recorded it, because he didn't want to do it as, as, a, <laughs> as a song. Um, but Johnny Marks felt like the television show might hurt his song or property. Uh, initially, he didn't want to do it, but Arthur talked him into it. And obviously, the television special is what everybody knows uh, when they think of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So it really took off big time and um, uh, developed into an annual thing. Uh, initially, it was only supposed to air for two years, three years at the most. So they hired these voice actors in Canada with a two-year agreement and paid them roughly $5,000 for their work. And some of them are not too happy now because <laughs> 55 years later they feel like they got gypped. But Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass had no idea that this thing would be on, you know, for 55 years. And it's probably going to be on for another 55 years if there's still television. Um, all the streaming today, you never know. <laughs> they say this year um, Rudolph and Frosty are going to be on Freeform as well as CBS, which that's never happened before. I'm not sure why they're doing that or how that'll work out, but AMC took over the, the later specials um, that Freeform used to show, and I might be hosting uh, this year's um, marathon, hopefully. But. Um, I might as well show you, um, I kind of brought you up to where Johnny Marks and Arthur brought this show to the network, NBC. And here's a little clip of Arthur talking about uh, the genesis of, of Rudolph and also the Misfit Girl doll, which everybody asks about. And there really isn't an answer uh, to that because Romeo Muller didn't write it in the script. I actually have three versions of the script. The one that's in the book is the earliest draft where there were characters that they took out of the story like a talking seal and some other characters. So here's a little clip of Arthur talking about how Rudolph came to be. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Rudolph. Um, you mentioned before John, your, your uh, friendship with Johnny Marks. Uh, one person we should introduce in the audience to, because I relied a lot on his research, is Rick Goldschmidt. Yes, uh, yes. Here, somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm hearing you relying a lot on your research tonight, so I thought. He <laughs> was the uh, historian, more or less, for Rankin Bass, and has written two books on the company. Rick. <laughs> Thank you. We, should, we should introduce Mick in this way. Uh, uh, I, I've gotten a lot of phone calls over the, over the years, and, and many of them I, uh, I, I try not to, to take too much time with. But Rick called me some years ago and told me that he was interested in doing a book on Rankin Bass, and I thought, oh yes, sure. And uh, <laughs> uh, then he called, we called back and he would tell me some more and then some more and some more. And finally I thought to myself, well, I think he's serious. And he had sent me some material that he was also working on. He had some materials that I had long forgotten about. Where he got them, I'll never know. Uh, out of dumpsters, I think. Uh, and so fi finally I said, well, all right, Rick, if you really want to do this, and he told me he had a publisher and he was all set to go, let me see what you've got. And I took a plane and I went out to, uh, he met me at the airport near Chicago took me home. I didn't know what to expect. And I found Mr. Middle America uh, with, a, with a, a, a wife and two children, a dog, in a full catastrophe. And, 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 and he was deadly serious about this book. And I took me into his home. He had practically a shrine with stuff that I had long forgotten about. 
So of course I encouraged him after that. He did write the book. We called it a portfolio because he has information in that book that I don't remember. And you're right to call it him because I don't, I can't answer a lot of your questions that Rick did. So Rick, I thought it would be proper for me to introduce you and let them know who you are. So now you can applaud him again. <laughs> Well, I thought I'd ask you a few questions that came out of the book you might not remember, but uh, <laughs> you, you, we talked about Johnny Marks before, and Rick quotes you, I, I'm sure accurately, calling him quite a character at some point. What what did you mean by that? Did Rick quote me saying that? <laughs> no, I know that Johnny was a character. He was a songwriter. He, again, a traditional songwriter. He had an office in the Brill Building, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a it's uh, Tin Pan Alley on Broadway. And all the famous songwriters lived and worked in, and worked in this building. And from one room, it was like an old MGM musical. You'd walk from one, one room to the other where somebody would be playing the piano trying to sell their songs. And Johnny worked there and wrote a lot of music. Uh, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, uh, many other songs that I don't remember, but uh, Rudolph was his number one. And again, you write music and you make films, you never know what's going to work. You do your best and you hope something stands out. And uh, in Johnny's case, it was Rudolph. And so who came up with the idea of turning Rudolph into a TV? Well, I did. And, and all you had was, you had the song, and you had, I guess, I a had story. I had Johnny down the street, living down the street. I knew him socially. <laughs> right. And it occurred to me that we story. could turn huh? and In terms of a story, all you had was the song. The lyric. Yeah. And the lyric is the, is the basis yeah. of the story, isn't it? It's a, we, we have obviously enlarged it and incorporated it. Like, you've got Cornelius and the monster, the, 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 the bumble. Uh, we, we, we just expanded on, on the lyric story. And was there ever any thought given to making it in a linear animation? Or was no, I always saw it in stop motion, in, in, in the three-dimensional form. And was and you, you term that, uh, you, the term you use for your particular brand of, um, of um, 3D animation, stop animation, is animagic. Yes, Where did that we, we coined that word. Um, and in terms of uh, the uh, narrator telling the story, was that also something that was um, conceived of from the very beginning? Well, we always thought that the narrator could also sing the song. We were always looking for someone who could perform besides just the, uh, besides just tell a story. Right. Um, so in the case, you know, Beryl Ives was the obvious, uh, obvious choice for that. He was the number one folk, folk music artist in America at the time. That was, that was very good in this. Burrow worked for us quite a bit after that. Okay. Um, I wonder, before I leave Rudolph, I'm going to ask you a question that I think you've gotten before, but you'd be surprised how many people ask me to ask this question tonight. So, um, On the island of misfit toys. <laughs> Why is that little girl there? Susie, yeah, the little doll. <laughs> this person who asked me says, this has bothered me since I saw Rudolph around age five. <laughs> is, is there a reason? Why the little girl is there? Yeah. Do we, we know why? Yeah. all the other mistress? She was under psychiatric care at the time. I get that question a lot too. <laughs> And like I said, it's not really discussed in the script, so you can only guess what, why she's there. I do know this, though. She has a little bit in the song, don't you? Yeah, she has a little bit in the that song. Um, yeah, but why is she a misfit? <laughs> something about, like, a doll that won't say how do you do or something? Right. It, there's a lyric in the song like that, but um, I think what happened was in 1964, they... They had one version of the special, which I offer um, with the commercials and so forth, but I don't have any left here now. A lot of people have been asking for it. Um, where the ending was an elf throwing packages off the sleigh with the credits on it, which I like better because the lettering on the packages matches the beginning of the show, and it's a simple ending, but um, they wanted to make a change, and I, I don't know if it's because people wrote in or if it's because the General Electric Company wanted a new song, so they changed the special around a little bit. 
they changed, um, were a couple of misfits to fame and fortune. <clears throat> and then at the very end, you see that campfire with the little girl doll, Charlie, and um, the elephant. And that scene was added, so the little girl doll then became more important in the story because she shows up in more than the song. And I think that's why people want to know why, you know, she's three of the characters you're seeing at the very end. Um, why was she there in the first place? Um, so a lot of changes were made to the special as far as um, the song, We Are Santa's Elves, was shortened up. There's a musical section in there that, that they took out, and they also had to take out where Yukon finally finds peppermint. Um, they call it the peppermint mine sequence. And um, he's licking his pick. Um, and the first time it, he says silver and gold. And, and then the punchline is cut out on CBS. Um, so that doesn't make any sense. Um, they should just restore everything and put it on CBS and maybe make it a 90 minute special with some added behind the scenes stuff, but I don't know. I've suggested that over the years, but unfortunately um, they really only care about the revenue that it generates um, with Target and, and all of that. So they don't really care about restoring the show the way that it should be. Um, so I can only try. Universal took over the specials last year, and they told me finally going to put it out on Blu-ray and do proper documentaries and so on and so forth. And then they got a bunch of people involved that kind of wrecked the whole thing. And um, before I knew it, I wasn't helping anymore. And it's like I have a lot of stuff to offer, and, and they just kind of cut me out of the whole thing. So... Um, don't buy the 2018 <laughs> releases. They, they stink, um, unfortunately. But um, the reason I do what I do is kind of to shine the light on the people that really put their heart and soul into the shows. And that's why Rudolph's still on 55 years later. And really, the person that deserves the most credit for this particular version of Rudolph is Romeo Muller Jr., the writer, because he came up with Clarice and the Bumble and Yukon Cornelius and all of that. And um, unfortunately, I know the Center of Puppetry Arts shows a puppet show, and there's a musical that goes around at Christmas time. They're not crediting or paying uh, Romeo Muller's estate. And I mean, when you don't credit the guy who actually wrote the show, uh, that's bad news. Um, Johnny Marks wrote the song, and Robert L. May wrote the short story book, but Romeo Muller did everything else, and everything else is why people are going to that puppet show and going to that musical. Um, so that's kind of rotten, but I think that's going to change over time. But Arthur Rankin, um, you saw him speaking there at the museum. He, he was really the driving force, the CEO behind Rankin Bass. And Jules was a friend of his that was good at lyrics and um, working with the voice actors on the East Coast. And Arthur was the one that went to Japan and oversaw the production kind of did everything else as far as business, you know, making sure it got on the network on time and, and that kind of thing. So he was very much a, a producer, uh, you know, the kind of producer that you would think he was to get things done, where Jules was more laid back and Arthur was more driven. Um, as far as the Canadian voice actors, they did become quite bitter. In fact, 
I might be a pairing with Paul Souls, who did Hermie the Elf um, in December at Steel City Con in Pittsburgh. And um, he doesn't really like, he doesn't like Rankin Bass Productions because he feels like he was, he was <coughs> slighted. And I became good friends with um, Billy Mae Richards, the voice of Rudolph. And they lived in the same community, and she tried to get him to sign stuff for me, but he wouldn't uh, because he was, you know, I'm associated with Arthur Rankin, so he feels like that was the guy who cheated him, but he didn't. Um, they, they were put together by Bernard Cowan in Canada, and he was sort of the Canadian arm of Rankin Bass, and their union agreed to a two-year thing so I mean it was what it was and um, they don't get residuals if, if the union <laughs> formed that agreement um, unfortunately but um, Billy Mae Richards realized this is what I'm going to be known for and um, she was more than happy to talk about it on the radio and television and all of that so she kind of came around Maybe I'll open it up to some questions because um, I'm sure you have some questions and there's a lot of things I'm probably not remembering about Rudolph. It's, it's very complicated um, when you break it down um, as far as, you know, Maury Laws' compositions and um, Tony Peters was the designer of the show. They were working on a movie called Willie McBean and His Magic Machine while they were doing Rudolph, and I have a couple of copies of that at my booth, and that's phenomenal. It looks just like Rudolph. It has the same voice actors, and they even added a few like James Doohan, Scotty from Star Trek. <laughs> so. Well, what happened to all the flocks? Um, good question. I talked about that in my panel yesterday, too. Um, so Rudolph and Santa popped up in 2006, and you might have seen uh, when they were on Antique Roadshow. Did anybody oh, see that? No. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll explain it then. Um, there's a secretary that worked at Rankin Bass in the 70s, in the early 70s to the late even into the 80s, named Barbara. And the set of the Rudolph characters, and there was more than one set, but there was one in the US, and it was, uh, they displayed them at NBC in the Rockefeller Plaza building. Many people remember going to, on field trips there and seeing the puppets, including the Bumble, who was, he was like 22 inches tall. And they were in a glass case for several years, and then at some point, NBC gave it back to the Rankin Bass offices. And Arthur and Jules had a little display case in their office with a bunch of the puppets. And then I guess one day they asked the secretary, Do you want these? You want to take them home? And she took them all home for her niece and nephew and um, they played with them like toys sometimes at Christmas time so the nephew eventually rescued Rudolph and Santa and that was it and he said that they used to keep them up in the attic and they kind of melted together and fell apart and they threw them away <laughs> so Rudolph and Santa were for sale, and uh, they brought him, he brought them on the Antique Road Show, and um, they were in rough shape. Santa was missing half his mustache. He couldn't stand up anymore, and Rudolph didn't have the bulb on his nose. He had clay, Play-Doh, stuck in the, in the spot. And um, Antique Road Show was way off <laughs> with their estimate, they said. It. They were only worth five thousand to six thousand dollars for the pair, <coughs> and that was not even close. So 
the guy, he emailed me and said, I have these and blah, blah, blah. It sounded like he was trying to like get as much money as he possibly could from me and I didn't really have that kind of money at the time. So he put them on eBay and um, a friend of mine called me up and said, you know, should I buy these things? And I said, are they real? And I said, yeah, they're real. And he called Arthur Rankin and he didn't know. So he bought them, but the guy kind of held them for ransom at the last minute and got them up to like 11 or 12,000 or something like that. Oh, wow. So then I coordinated the restoral of the puppets because they were in rocky shape. So I knew my friends in Hollywood at Screen Novelties could fix them up perfectly. They worked with Ray Harryhausen on the tortoise and the hare, and they did the SpongeBob stop motion specials and Elf, the special based on the musical. And they restored them completely. They took them apart. They got Rudolph's nose working, lighting up again. Um, they found the yak hair that um, they needed for Santa's mustache. And, and they knew what those Japanese, how they made them um, from scratch. So they restored them. We took them out on the road. <laughs> I had them at the Brookfield Zoo. The line was all the way around this big giant tent at Christmas time. People came from Michigan, Wisconsin, everywhere. And then we had them at Ohio, um, Ohio Con, Mid-Ohio Con. We had them at Wizard World. We had them at a bunch of places. And then we took them on television too, on CBS and, and various shows. And then my friend's business was kind of failing at a point and so was his marriage and he had to sell them and he sold them to a guy for a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars and um, the guy still has them but he doesn't want to bring them out for for people to see and all that and I don't I don't like that too much I like to share this history and this this stuff but um, he was offered 200 grand on the show Hollywood <laughs> Treasures, and then he put them up on eBay a couple of years ago for 10 million. <laughs> and they all called me up, um, like news stations and newspapers, and, and what do you think of this 10 million thing? And I was like, it's kind of sad that they're being used as a commodity than, you know, in a museum where people can see them. So, I found another guy who has a skinny Santa, Santa and Rudolph, and he will bring them out. And so I'm going to start a pairing with them again. And then there's another Santa in Japan that Tad Moshinaga, the head animator on these, um, had. And he's in kind of rocky shape. He's in one of my books, uh, The Making of Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And San uh, Mrs. Santa's head popped up there. and. King Kong from Mad Monster Party. I mean, there's a lot of puppets around, but most of them are in Japan. So, I hope that answers your question. It's a long... I'm going to build the rest of them, not missing. What's that? I'm probably going to try to find the pods that are just floating around and try to put things back together or just make one from scratch so we can repair the ones that are missing in action. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, but uh, the only thing, I used to have some of the puppets. I had a couple from the first Christmas. Um, I sold them to the guys that did the restoral so they could restore those and I can borrow them when I need them. So I brought Father Time, the Red Skelton puppet, to Chiller Theater, um, Sister Teresa, Smokey the Bear. There's a bunch of them in the U.S. that I know where they're at, and I can borrow them for, for different things. Maybe maybe <laughs> what we'll do um, eventually is I'll get my friends to loan them to the Center of Puppetry Arts for a period of time. Like maybe six months to a year or something, you know. Because uh, they're all about the history, uh, how uh, screen novelties, they, they 
want to share it and let people see it. So they have to restore a couple. Actually, there's a couple they have that would be good for Dragon Con because they made this fantasy movie called Marco that very few people know about. Uh, it starred Desi Arnaz Jr. Um, it's a very elaborate costume kind of th uh, musical. And there's a really cool stop motion part where there's these tree elves um, and they sing this song, Peace Berries. And it's, it's a really good fantasy type sequence that may be the best puppetry thing that they ever did. Um, Masaki Azuka, who also worked on the film, he thinks it's their best animation. Hi. Uh, could you touch on the revision the following year where Santa actually uh, find, uh, delivers the misfit toy? Well, um, it goes back to them. Yeah. Um, Jules Bass seemed to remember there was some kind of a writing campaign that a lot of people wrote letters that they wanted to see Santa go back. But I'm not sure that that's true because when the executive, Will Willard Saloff from GE, wanted a new song and they replaced We're a Couple of Misfits with Fame and Fortune, they had to make some other changes to the program as well for him. And the reason they did it was he was the one that got it on NBC. So it was Arthur Rankin reluctantly made the changes, but he did it because the guy got it on NBC, you know. Um, and that same guy worked at Montgomery Wards years before and knew how popular the book was, so he was also part of the reason why it went on network television. So it wasn't so much a creative choice, it was more of a, you know, a favor that they did for him. And um, if you look at the credits too, you'll see directed by Larry Romer, and Larry Romer didn't direct anything. Um, they gave him that credit because he helped get it on television too. Um, obviously when, when the show's being filmed in Japan, the Japanese people are directing the, you know, from the storyboard. Um, so it's, a lot of times they would give honorary <laughs> credits to people. Any other questions? Oh. What are the origins of that very uh, distinctive pain and magic style? Well, um, there's a guy named Tadahito uh, Moshinaga who um, was seen as the father of stop motion in Japan, and that is who Arthur hired to do Animagic. And he was mistakenly um, brought to Japan through the government of, of uh, Washington, brought a delegation to New York and hooked up with Arthur Rankin because he was making commercials at the time. So they brought him over to Japan to see the type of animation they were doing there, and he loved it. So Arthur kind of discovered it, and Tanahito was the master. So he hired him and to produce the Pinocchio series and so well received and he did commercials with that style too that he knew Rudolph was gonna work um, but the thing that they really did was bring personality to the art form you know before that there was George Powell puppet tunes there was our cloaky, which is more claymation, but through these puppets, they brought personality with these incredible voice actors, whether they were famous like Burl Ives or Canadian. Uh, the Canadians worked in radio too, so that's why they were so good. Radio lasted longer in, in Canada, and um, they could visualize characters without really seeing the animation. 
and they were kind of over the top, you know, Yukon and Hermie and all that. So it really worked to bring characters to life that I don't think in stop motion animation that was ever seen before, that type of personality. And then it just took off, you know, Fred Astaire and <laughs> um, James Cagney and all these great people they hired um, really changed, I think, stop motion puppetry forever. Um, <laughs> And then the Heat Miser and Snow Miser yeah. is probably the two yeah. Yeah. most yeah. famous yeah. puppets um, around. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it kind of goes in the same, same, along the same line. What was the decision making process about whether they went with Animagic or traditional cell animation for some of these things? Because, like, he was asked that. And he was like, oh, we just were going to. It was like, did Arthur just say, that's what it's going to be, or was there some decision about it with some other um, things in the portfolio as well? Well, after after Rudolph was a success, everybody wanted a Rudolph. Um, Edgar Bergen called him up and wanted a Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd, which they worked on but never released. Um, everybody wanted that stop motion. So if they were in production with a stop, motion special like Santa Claus is Coming to Town or The Little Drummer Boy. Um, and another network wanted a special too, then sometimes that would negate whether it was cell animated or puppetry. In 1968, they put out The Little Drummer Boy, but they also had Cricket on the Hearth, which was on the Danny Kaye or not Danny K, Danny Thomas show, and then uh, Mouse on the Mayflower, which was also cell animated. So I think they had to keep various studios in Japan working on these projects simultaneously because eventually uh, Rankin Bass had specials on all three networks and sometimes they aired against each other. Um, and that's why Frosty the Snowman <coughs> The characters in that are not seen in Frosty's Winter Wonderland, which was on ABC. They couldn't use Karen, Professor Hinkle, Hocus Pocus, so they had to create new characters like Crystal and Jack Frost. And it wasn't a true sequel because it was on a different network. So there was all this stuff going on uh, as far as business goes. And Arthur Rankin had a lot to do with it because he would just go into NBC and say, we want to make the little drummer boy into a special based on the song. And they would say, well, how much will it cost? And when will you get it to us? And he was like, okay, I can have you a treatment by Monday. And that I know on that special, he sold it on a Friday and called Romeo Muller up on the phone and he wrote it over the phone. <laughs> um, so by Monday he had the script, you know, um, written by someone in the rank of bass offices to deliver. It was that kind of thing. It wasn't like today where it has to go through hoops and focus groups and all this stuff and by the time it gets on the air it's not anything like what they envision so but Frosty was done in cell animation because they wanted it to look like a Christmas card and Paul Coker jr. designed Christmas cards for Hallmark for many many years so that's why they started shifting in the cell animation too because look at twas the night before Christmas that also looks like a Christmas card and that's a great special so they all, they all, I think their success rate was pretty high as far as both cell animation and animagic. Um, I like it all. <laughs> uh, so I was born in 1964, so mm -hmm. I've seen it every year that I remember. And I just don't think there's a more controversial character for my family than Abominable. 
because <laughs> my brother, my younger brother, was completely traumatized by him, still is. Aww. So now that Target has all those toys, every year I send him a new abominable toy. <laughs> 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 But I always felt sorry for Abominable, so I just wondered what the fan reaction has been over the years, because he's still my favorite. Well, my brother was afraid of the Bumble, um, I remember, when we were small. And the scariest part of the Bumble is when he peeks out over the, the mountains. And I found out years later that Romeo Muller put that in there because one of his friends, when they camped out or something, had a nightmare about a monster <laughs> peeking over mountains. So he put that in there. And actually, Clarice was a friend of his, too. He, he put a name in there from a friend of his. And, and there's a lot of other things he put in there for friends and relatives. So. The, the cool thing about the Bumble, and that's my favorite character, by the way. I like the monster characters. Um, the cool thing about him is he gets reformed. Yeah. And a lot of the villains got reformed in Rankin Bass uh, specials like the Winter Warlock. And, and that's more satisfying than having a villain get killed or die or whatever. Um, it just, that, that's part of the reason why people keep watching it um, over and over and over again. Um, so you got to really give it to Romeo Muller for coming up with that concept. And the afterword in my Rudolph book was written by Andrew Stanton, who worked on, well, he directed Wally e and um, Finding Nemo and, and won the Academy Award for those two. And he brought that up about the, the villains being reformed and the, and the world, you're just drawn into this world. You don't think of them as puppets. You don't think of them as stop motion. It's a, a real believable universe. And he's right about that. And um, he put a nod to Rankin Bass's reformed villains in Toy Story 2, I think it was, where um, Buzz Lightyear discovered that his father was uh, Zerg. <laughs> and, that, and that was from Star Wars with Darth Vader, I think, um, was Luke's yeah. father. So um, that was kind of a, a nod to, to Romeo Muller. And they've done other things, too, in the Pixar films that they wanted to create a Paul Coker look, or they made um, the villain in The Incredibles look like the Heat Miser. <laughs> Any other questions? I know for modern day stop motion, when they're doing the voices, quite often the whole front of the face or the mouth will come off so they can do the different shapes. Back then, how did they do that type with different models for, for the voicing? Well, when I, um, when I owned Sister Teresa and Octavia from the first Christmas, um, they came with a little Japanese uh, container that had all their eyes and all their mouths. So they did swap out. So they swapped them out, and they were painted Chinese paper, I found out later. Um, where they built up paint for the lips and they would repideograph in um, around the eyes and the teeth. Um, when Chris Crinkle is making that face where he better not pout kind of face, he's making this real weird mouth and it's like a painted piece of paper with repideograph lines in there. So. I would hate to work with that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it would just take forever to, to, to do that. And then when Nightmare Before Christmas came along, they had like, who knows how many jack heads and um, you know all the different configurations and things, but putting in paper that you'd have to like sort of glue temporary and change it out, I it's amazing what they did because it doesn't look like that when you watch it. it. It 
puppets. Uh, they brought the puppets pretty much to life and you don't really see the technical things. Although if you freeze frame it, you can see anytime a puppet jumps up in the air or falls backwards, you can see wires um, holding them up. Um, and they peg the puppets through the floor when they walked. Um, and Masaki Azuka, when he came to Bermuda, I helped with an exhibit there, and the people at, at, that did the exhibit had Arthur's puppets on doll stands, and he hated that. He was like, it's got to be pegged up through the floor, so I think he changed it. And then they actually brought Mrs. Claus from the year with uh, Santa Claus and Santa there, and the great Ack from oh, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus is there too, and he's a big puppet. So he was very particular about how they handled the puppets. And they used gloves when they, when they moved them, but eventually they would still get dirty and they'd have to redo their outfits or, or even make a whole new puppet. What was the whole, like how long was the whole production process on this? The Rudolph uh, was 18 months. Uh, <laughs> So it was a long, and Arthur said that some of them slept by their puppets. <laughs> um, and when they had a, a Tad Moshinaga exhibit in Japan last year or two years ago, and it's pictured in my book, there's some pictures that he say, color pictures, where you can see the sets, where they start and where they end, like the wood things in front of the ice and the snow. and. Um, they had to do the sets and film simultaneously some of those sequences and I could see them sleeping by their puppets. <laughs> any were, they, were they producing any at the same like were they just focused on Rudolph when they were making that or were they doing multiple? They did do uh, Willie McBean and his magic machine and that and that looks a lot like Rudolph um, there's a sequence where um, a dinosaur falls over a cliff or something, and it looks like when the bumble gets pushed over by Yukon. Um, so it's maybe they use the same sets too and the same ideas, but changed it a little bit. <laughs> but all the voices are the same and it looks the same, so it's it's kind of cool. Yeah, they would work on more than one. Do you have another project in the works? I have a Frosty book coming out this year because it's his 50th anniversary. And, uh, the post office was going to make their uh, stamps, their Christmas stamps, Frosty. So they got a hold of me last December or January, somewhere around there to make sure the text was right, and I added in, this is what I do, I add in all the names that worked on the shows, because they didn't have any of that, like they didn't say Rome, Romeo Muller wrote it, and Maury Laws, and all that. So I was kind of looking forward to those stamps, and then they said about a month ago, they're not coming out because of rights issues. The problem with Frosty is there's the song, that's owned by one group. Then um, Warner Brothers owns Frosty's Winter Wonderland and part of the character, and then Universal owns the original Frosty. And it's like, I think they're their own worst enemies too, and they want too much money, and, and then it just never happens. So they missed out on, uh, on Frosty's 50th. I know networks nowadays use a digital time compression to make room for more commercials and things like that. Has that been done to Rudolph? Is that, yeah. Is that take that? And would that be a way to to squeeze in scenes that you that you like to see added back in? Um, what What's your thoughts about all that? If you If you watch the CBS version, um, the problem with it is that it, the music has a warble in it. Like it sounds like it's on a warped record. And then um, when they did the 
the, were a couple of misfits. For some reason, some editor edited in fame and fortune, so the mouths aren't matching the lyrics, and it's jumping all over the place. So right now, the network version is about as bad as it can get. <laughs> and, and I put that on my blog. My blog gets like millions of hits, uh, you know, around the country, and I'm sure somewhat someone pointed it out to CBS that this thing that they keep airing is like so badly edited but honestly they don't care about the show they just care about the commercials target commercials and all that so until somebody cares or until there's some kind of a you know maybe a internet uh, <laughs> you know you go signature target? thing yeah, we can try that, but <laughs> it's Target, um, well, Walmart, um, at Easter time, Walmart had a, a Blu-ray of Here Comes Peter Cottontail um, exclusive. It wasn't on Amazon, it was just a So I bought a bunch of copies because I found some at a store, and I got it home, and it was the syndicated version that was edited for television that was about 41 minutes long. So that like is complete garbage and they probably had to recall all those or maybe they didn't, maybe they don't care. Um, I pointed it out to Walmart and Universal but I don't think they, they care, unfortunately. Yeah, Universal has everything from 60 through 74. <clears throat> and then Warner Brothers has everything 74 through Thundercats, which includes The Year Without a Santa Claus. And that's why The Year Without a Santa Claus Blu-ray is better than the Universal ones. Mm -hmm. They had a documentary on there with Arthur Rankin and me and a bunch of other people that worked on the shows. And the special looks perfect. And when they air it on AMC now, they air it uncut. Um, so they'll start it at like 5.15 and go through whenever it is. Even though there's commercials, they show the whole thing um, on time compressed. So maybe on Freeform, they might start doing that too. I don't know. But seems like the the money part of it is always the worst thing you know like if they know willie mcbean's not going to make any money they won't release it or the ballad of smoky the bear they won't release it it'll just sit in their archives or they don't even know they own it because um, in the panel i did yesterday i got a phone call when they made the batman movie with arnold schwarzenegger and george clooney's uh, the worst batman movie Ever. Um, and they put that snow miser scene in there with uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Warner Brothers called me up who owns the rights on this and I'm like you do <laughs> and I told them to call Jules Bass and, and um, Maury Laws and I guess they got big checks out of it too and they might not have if I didn't tell them they owned it. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. Warner Brothers doesn't even know what they own because they're too big. Mm -hmm. And then they change people there like light bulbs. <laughs> so the person I dealt with when I did my first book is long gone. And um, they sent me um, all the photos because Arthur Rankin was in my corner. They didn't want to mess with him. So they sent me everything and they never asked for it back either. So I still have all the transparencies and slides and all that stuff. I think I remember uh, maybe Mad TV might have done like a Rudolph parody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Raging Rudolph, the, Rudolph, the Rain produced, Father. Did they get produced by the Japanese? or? Did they no, that was Corky Quick and Bush. Um, an American fan 
of Rankin Bass, but they were so violent that Arthur wasn't <laughs> flattered. <laughs> uh, I looked, knew. They looked really good. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's why I'm going yeah, They were kind of funny, too, you know, in, the, in a crude way. And then he did a, a pack of gifts now, which was supposed to be Apocalypse Now. Um, and he sent me pictures. I put them in my first book. And, you know, a lot of things were going on around that time where they were putting them on David Letterman every year, and they put them on uh, Home Improvement. And everybody had like a little parody of Rudolph or even uh, South Park <laughs> did a few. So. You kind of touched on this earlier, but um, different characters show up in, in several different uh, um, episodes or series uh, specials. Um, did they just like, do they use the same or did, did they just throw them out and build them again? They used the same a few times. Like Big Ben. Right. Was in a couple of them. Very, very seldom did they use the same puppet or even the same design. Look how different Santa looks and uh, Santa Claus is coming to town as compared to Twas the Night Before Christmas where he just has sort of a beard underneath his face. Um, I think they asked Paul Coker to do a different looking Santa every time they they used the Santa. Um, so they they tried to mix it up. And then again, it was all these networks involved, you know, three networks at the time, and they were all competing against each other. So they had to make each show look different than the other ones that were still running on the networks. Similar to this question, are there any Easter eggs that show up like that they de de deliberately put in from one special to the other? Not that I can think of, the, but there is kind of a funny thing in, in Rudolph that everyone brings up. Um, when they when they film the, the second season, the 65 episode, and they had the umbrellas dropping the packages out, they dropped the, um, <laughs> the, the bird that only could swim off without an umbrella. Uh, and I think that was a, an inside joke kind of thing. <laughs> um, although Romeo Muller wrote the Return to Oz and you know the Scarecrow had a heart and the, or the Tin Man and the Scarecrow had a brain so maybe he could fly. Oh. Any other questions? Japanese studio did that, did that wind up doing totally American productions or did they still allow? They, <clears throat> is it still around? No, it's not around anymore because I, I wanted them to make more puppets for my events and things like that and they said they don't, they didn't have the, the studio or the, the machines or any of that anymore. Um, but they broke off into other companies too. Some of them went on to make significant animated films and things. I think the Nutcracker Suite was some of the um, the Rankin Bass animators. Um, you know, they went on to do other things, and some of them retired. Like Tad, who did Rudolph, he retired, and uh, another guy, Hiroshi Tabata, took over around the time of. Santa Claus is coming to town. So he never, he felt inferior to Tad. He, he, he thinks Rudolph was the best. Um, the animation ever was. Even though some animation people think it looks rough, like crude. They kind of move herky-jerky. Um, but I prefer the early stuff too. So I think he's probably right that Tad was was the better of the two, but he did a good job too. And um, I know he's retired now. Um, that's a funny thing. Most of these guys, if they're still living, are in their 90s. And Paul Coker Jr. signed Heat Miser and Snow Miser cards for me just a couple weeks ago. He retired from <laughs> Mad Magazine a couple years ago. So he's not even drawing anymore. So I kind of feel honored that. <laughs> You know, he signed these cards for me, and I had those up at the 
at the booth as well. And any books that we have left are, are a $10 off discount um, today. Um, so if you have any more questions, just stop by the booth at 3227 on the third floor by the vendors. And thanks for coming. Thank you.